everybody, what's up? It is Doug Welker here with Josh Rhodes, and we are here with another episode of Pull and Trigger. And today we are doing a Q&A episode. Last week on the show, we asked you guys to send in some questions, and we got a bunch of good ones. So uh, before we get into it here, Josh, you want to say what's up? What's going on, everybody? I hope you all ain't snowed in like me and Doug have been the past couple of days. Yeah, the show this week, even to record it, we didn't know we were going to be able to. I know with my work, it's been crazy um, in and out, and I'm, I had just a little bit of time here to do the show, so we wanted to bang this out. So apologies if it's a little bit shorter. But yeah, I know Josh had a bunch, and so did we. Down here in St. Louis, not much uh, not much monster trucking going on here, personally. Oh, no. Matter of fact, you take a, a claw buster out in the snow right now, you might lose it. <laughs> I know. Luckily, uh, the flotation tires, they'd be good. We actually had oh, yeah. um, our friend Aaron, we posted a video uh, the truck Hellion, his freestyle RC truck in the snow the other day. If you haven't checked that out, he's the truck who hydroplaned on the lake. He has paddle tires and just skips across. It's pretty cool. All right. Yeah, I so, haven't seen I haven't seen that video yet, but that Hellion truck is an amazing build from Aaron. Yeah, and that's like his stunt truck now. Whenever he wants to do like a fun gimmick, he's done that. So, and it's obviously proven to be waterproof. Um, well, let's get into it here because we have a bunch of questions here. Uh, to go through here, and I will, let me see, we'll just alternate here. Um, I'll tell you what, Josh, you do the honors. So we have a big question here, this this lead one here. This is from Kevin Mendez. He's on YouTube. You want to read it off, Josh? Yeah, he says, I have a very good question for those of us who want to open up our own clubs. Uh, he explains that he works at a hobby headquarter, hobby quarters in Foxborough, Mass. Uh, his boss appointed him to create a Monster Jam type of an event. And he's basically looking for information on how to really get started in the RC monster truck world. Yeah. So he's wanting to put a race on. Yeah. So let me tell you this. We're going to do a short answer here. I'd like to do a show on this in the future because there are a lot of people out there that ask, you know, how do I get started? And Trigger King started with four people. I mean, frankly, that's, that's what it was. And uh, then Josh, you came in, whooped our butts as we were running just garbage equipment at first, but, uh, well, I couldn't help it. <laughs> you don't, you don't, Hey, not anymore. It's tougher nowadays. You still win, but it's, it's tougher. Um, so let me just tell you this. If you, so if your hobby, if your hobby place has tasked you with starting a monster jam style event, so here's what I would do. And I actually, I have experience in this. So you don't need a lot. First off, again, if you have four trucks, fantastic. You, there's your bracket. Keep it. Yeah. Simple. You got a bracket right there. Yeah. And, uh, he actually asked about qualifying. Sorry, the question was longer. He actually asked about qualifying and transponders and how that works. So, hmm. because for those of you not versed in standard RC racing, the transponder, you will hook a transponder onto your car, a truck or whatever it is. And that's your lap counting system. That's how RC racing works. And of course, full scale racing too. But with RC, that's what we're talking about here. Um, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But as far as events set up, if you've seen Monster Jam, I mean, I'm guessing that's what you're wanting to do. Just follow that format. I would just qualify, race, and then do a freestyle. And you don't have to do judge freestyle, but it's fun to do judge freestyle. So I would say, you know, if you get a couple of judges, do it that way. And then uh, it's on the fun to do the judge freestyle. And it also gives more drive time to the people there as well, because racing can go by pretty quick, especially if you're eliminated in the first round. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, our, we're a little bit skewed in our events because we have so many people. So if you get if you get eliminated, if you're like one of the first brackets out and you get eliminated, you might be sitting there for 40 minutes without anything to do. So um, let me ask, so the qualifying, right? Let's talk about this. Assuming you have a track, let's assume you have a small monster truck track set up, um, sets of cars, really jumps is all you need, but set it up similar to a monster jam style track or just look at our youtube videos we post the layouts even if you want to see at the beginning of the videos bob does a good job with that so um check that out but as far as the event format so for qualifying with monster trucks no we don't qualify much anymore just because our events are too long and we just randomly do it i know we qualify and be more fun but when you got 100 some trucks there's just no way we're going to be able to do it so we just randomly draw it um qualifying is yeah, fun and, and not to butt in, but speaking for from it. somebody that's been it's been in a series where you've had to qualify before, Trigger King, we do six brackets a day in racing, and we're getting ready to do at least eight brackets with the new LNT class that's mm -hmm. coming out. A series that I competed in before, we did three brackets of racing, one class, but we qualified, and it took almost all day just to get the three rounds of qualifying in plus the three rounds of racing in. I love our Trigger King format. It gets more chances, more trucks for you to race, more opportunities for guys. 
Yeah, and you know, I wish we could qualify more, um, but as Josh said, it just doesn't work. We're actually, we are more Monster Jam style and that we fully admit we're putting on a show. Like that's kind of what we're doing. And that's what the random qualifying does. It gets to the racing right away. Yes, it's not quite fair, but um, I'd also say if you're going to win a bracket, win the freaking bracket. <laughs> Run better than the other guy. I know you might race the fast guy soon, but that's just how we have to do it. How you should do it, though, I think. Qualifying is fun. Assuming you don't have a million trucks, just use a stopwatch. You don't have to be super precise because here's the other thing. Monster truck tracks are kind of crazy in how they, they work. Even if you have like drag racing timing system, where to put those beams is tricky because if you have to run a lap on a course, it could set that beam off. Or if your trucks are in the air, they won't trip a beam. So it's kind of, there's a lot of logistics and actually timing an RC monster truck race if you're going to do it with an actual scale track. Um, I guess you could use transponders if you're going to drive around like a standard RC track if you want, but then that's not Monster Jam style. That's RC racing. So just use a stopwatch. And you know what? There's going to be a little bit of human error. Who cares? Just use a stopwatch. Yeah, you're so you're going to. What, Josh? Just so be it, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you're use still, a stopwatch. There's there's so many racetracks out there that are very difficult to do with the timing system. Mm -hmm. I've always been against the timing system. I've never really cared for it as far as RC monster truck racing goes because you lose out on the ability to use a lot of the tracks that are out there because you pass by the finish line multiple times. Yes, and it screws up the system. And I think if you have a tree to start on, that's fun. But outside of that for the finish, there's just too many variables. You're going to limit yourself in track design. Um, so yes, use a stopwatch. You're still going to separate the fast guys from the slow guys. That's still going to happen. So even though you might be off a you know, hundredth or a thou or something like that, you're going to still have separation. Racing, just watch our videos. Um, like a Monster Jam event uh, or a Monster Truck event, you stage the trucks up, say go first to cross the finish line and just watch for penalties. Um, and freestyle, judge freestyle, we do a minute 30. The trucks have a minute 30 and you can roll over once with a no penalty flip over. And um, the second one, you're done. So again, it's, I actually don't even know how long full-size Monster Jam gives. Now, how, how long do they give, Josh, in full? Is it two uh, minutes? 60 seconds. Uh, we had 60 seconds in an arena and a minute and 30 in stadiums okay. last year. Okay, so I, I'm not totally off. Um, but yeah, man, that's how we do it. Uh, we'll do another video and maybe have some friends on, maybe from some other RC clubs. I think that'd be a good idea to see how they started it. Um, We'll do that soon. That might take a little bit of organizing to get some of the people on, but we'll do a full thing on that. Hey, good luck. If you have, uh, you know, if you get that going up there, shout me out, um, Doug at BigSquidRC.com. I'll run a Monster Truck Madness on your race. I'll help promote it to get the word out there. So you're doing the good work, my friend. So again, that was Kevin Mendez. So let's see here. Tim Ellis, Tim Ellis, YouTube. He asks, my question is in regards to the racing episode what's the best way to practice for an event? I don't want to buy my first, wait, sorry. I don't want my first time there to be the only time I have to run a course. Do you have a standard ramp height width or lane width? Should I just build a few ramps, get some cones, run the configs I've seen on the videos and different surfaces like dirt asphalt? Yes, your last, your last one there. We don't really have a standard height. Uh, ramp width is what, two feet, Josh? I know that's what we ran oh, with a yeah. while. Usually, um... Your standard size truck usually, at least for almost every club I've been in, they've gone at least another truck width as far mm -hmm. as the lane length, just to give guys a little bit of extra room to hit the jump. And if you honestly, if you miss that jump, you should be penalized with as wide as it is. Yeah. Um, you know, as for the rest of it, just get some cones. I would really get some cones and just try, look at some of our videos. Again, we put the layouts there. There's some other clubs that run too, just just do that as well. I would just run some basic layouts for you guys uh, that were for you to try out because I know you say you want to, you don't want to be cold at the event, but I, I, in just seeing things, I know that your big thing is just practice your reactions, your corners and how you read the track. When you get there to a race, you're going to watch the other racers anyways. I think you'll be familiar with the track and ultimately you're just, you're going to have to get out there because your nerves are going to be your nerves are going to be so, so much that uh, you're going to, that's really your first races or you're racing against your nerves. You're really not even racing the other guy or the track. You just have to understand what it's like to be in competition. Would you agree, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree a hundred percent. One thing you're going to find out when you're out there racing on uh, your home course is you're going to see where you're going to be able to set up for corners. That's one thing you'll be able to pick out by just walking into a racetrack after you've done a little practice at home, you'll be able to walk out there. Okay. I know where this rocks at. That's where I need to break to get around this corner kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
you'll learn uh, that just by being around home. And he asked about ramp or um, lane width. That really depends on how much room we have. We don't really go in with a set. I don't think a normal little Bob, Bob and Chris who do the tracks are probably like you idiot. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> the, I want to say at least four feet, but I know we've run wider ones before. It really just depends on the width we have. I know the retro trucks run tighter tracks nowadays because they don't have the speed and we actually try and give them their own like tracks, but the bigger trucks wider typically. So yeah, uh, the question was mainly about practice though. So I would just say, grab some cones, some ramps and just kind of go off of that. Just mess with different different layouts and um, try and figure out how to get your breaking points quick because that's what you'll have to do. Uh, you want to read another one, Josh? Yeah, we got another one here from uh, Sabarison. Uh, he's got a really long first paragraph here talking about how much he loves the one one and the scale. But his second paragraph is what I really wanted to get into. And he says, given the MO, the dual MOA motor design on such uh, trucks like a Claude Buster, uh, why do you allow it to compete in the same class as an SMT-10 or an LMT? Basically, because there are advantages to both trucks, honestly. The Claude might have a little bit more of an advantage with gearing the, or setting your ESC up to be a little quicker in the front and a little slower in the rear. But it doesn't quite have the ability to turn into a corner like an SMT does. You'll see a lot of times SMTs will be able to just nail a tight corner while the Claude Buster, you'll have to really throttle it, hit the brakes and hope that rear end slides around to get around that corner. It doesn't quite have the throw as uh, an SMT or an LNT based vehicle. I mean, that's pretty much the reason why. And plus, honestly, in real life monster trucks, you don't see guys get turned away very often because they've got an off the wall or a different style design of a setup underneath the truck. Mainly people are going to be staring at it. I was watching an event last night, uh, Columbus 1992, and there was everybody was staring at the brand new barefoot that just came out. This was the, is it the belly dragger, the Dodge barefoot. What the, is this the belly truck? I believe so. A barefoot 10. I can't remember if that was the belly. I truck think that, I think that's the belly truck. I could be wrong on it, but yeah, sorry, go on. But yeah, it was it was the debut of that truck, and that's all they could talk about was how different and how how much people were staring at it and watching because they wanted to see what that truck would do. And I think that's the same thing that we get at some of our events. Somebody comes out with an off the wall style design, and you're automatically standing over there on the other end of the track like this, kind of scratching your chin, going, "I wonder how I work on my truck." <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's another reason too, I guess. I mean, frankly, logistics. We'd have to split more classes and we'd have even more brackets and we just don't have the time like in a day. There's exactly. just not enough time in the day. And as Trigger King started, you know, I mentioned before, it started with four trucks, right? And we had clods and shaft trucks and there was never really, we were always running them together because we didn't have enough trucks to be separate. And then as we started that way, different, different trucks worked differently and it wasn't really too much of an advantage. Like it's not well, clods were more dominant back then when we started. That's just because clod setups were better setups. Now you have these awesome shaft trucks that are out there to where competitively it's not that it's, I don't know. It's competitively, not, I believe the field is as even as it's ever been. Yeah, because there, there are real distinct advantages. And now you have this cush drive center diff design that's right in there with the clods and the other thing. It's not, listen, it's not perfect. In a perfect world, sure. Have the mod clods together have the shaft trucks, but this is ultimately an RC race and uh, the clods have been around forever. So it's kind of, they're a special deal. Clods are special to where they do run and you will see some bigger events. We'll separate pro mod shafty from pro mod clod. Um, but it's just, it's logistically, it doesn't really make sense. And we don't really have a competitive advantage one way or the other in ours. Um, the retro trucks are clod buster only almost always. Yes. So that's, that is a class of that, but sport mod and, the other uh, in, in pro mod, no, that's 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 why um, we don't do it. It's mainly logistics, and we just kind of always done it, and it, it's been fine. Let's move on here. We have Tim needs a hobby. Tim, what's up? He's always commenting, so thank you. Uh, let's see. One, Josh, this, I'm I'm going to let you take this one here a little bit because it has some clod stuff. But would you overdrive the front axle or underdrive the rear on an SMT10 to achieve what Josh was talking about with tuning the front motor on a clod? I have both now the SMT 10 and Claude with an LMT on the way. My SMT 10 is already set up for sport mod. I just need to swap the motor to be legal. I'm learning that my Claude is going to take some work just to be competitive in retro. Let's see. I have a regulator chassis on hand. Um, oh, he, he says that his regulator J concepts retro truck has already passed the price point of a new LMT. <laughs> yes. The LMT is actually cheap for what you get. That's the thing. It's affordable for that compared to building a Claude of any kind. 
Yeah, but it his, is honestly a, a custom regulator. It's that's quite a bit of money you're looking. Well, you're already like you're already over almost over the price because the regulator is two hundred yeah. something, right? Almost three hundred dollars, and then uh, yeah. So, anyways, the, the question though is, could you overdrive the front axle or underdrive the rear on an SMT ten to achieve what Josh was talking about with the front motor on a clock? I've seen people do it. Uh, one thing that I have noticed is with a clod buster, your instant power, as soon as you hit the throttle, that truck takes off, it's gone off the starting line. I've noticed trucks with the SMT 10 that have that overdrive in the front don't quite necessarily leave as hard as the truck in the other lane with the MOA setup. I think that's the disadvantage to doing it. And I don't think they get quite up to speed down a straightaway like a clod buster will. Again, like I said, you hit the throttle with a clod with a little bit of overdrive in the front end, it takes off. Whereas the SMT has a little bit, it takes a little, it's not much of a difference. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying it's like a, a night and day difference, but it's like a, a night and mid afternoon difference. I'll put it that way. You, you take off and it's, it's just not quite as uh, speedy as a clod buster is out of the gate. The other, dis there's a disadvantage too, is a clod buster, the axles are truly independent of each other. The problem yes. with the, when you do that on a shaft drive, the overdrive, especially if you go over an underdrive and make it more severe, is that drive line is all working together and you have gears running at different speeds and axles running at different speeds that are all connected. You're going to wear your drives. I mean, it depends what kind of track you're on. I mean, dirt's not as big of a deal, but as the power goes up, you're going to wear that system out even more or throw drive shafts or other things like that. So just be aware that the clod does have the advantage of when you do tune that they are independent of each other. And so the dragging isn't as, it's, it's not as, uh, what am I trying to say here? It's not as pronounced, I suppose, as when you do have that system hooked up with the axle spinning differently, when you have shafts hooked up to a center transmission. So just be aware of that. You could mess with it. I mean, why not? I just haven't really seen anybody have success with it very much. I'll yeah, let you take this advice. next here, Josh. Uh, next one I see here is from Chris Wood here on YouTube. He says, I have an SMT 10 and a stock clod, but I want to build uh, basically with a better chassis. And he's wondering what cage style chassis are out there as far as uh, the SMT 10 goes. Uh, I've seen quite a few from Southwest Monster Shop. Uh, the KK1, 1, 2, and 3 that he's come out with is a pretty neat little design. That's what I was going to uh, suggest. Yeah. Yeah, you could, you could do that. Uh, there's Freestyle RC, but I don't know if the axial axles really work with, the, they're, they're a heavier chassis. Uh, I wouldn't do that can, with the Freestyle. The Freestyles are yeah. too, Josh built his stuff really heavy duty and those axial axles, not so much. They, they may not, I mean, for a race truck, maybe. If you're yes, not okay, maybe. For a, for a race truck, maybe. Uh, for a Freestyle truck, no. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to, you're going to tear those trucks up just like you would uh, the, rod ends on a freestyle rc truck that seems to be the, the big weak point yep on a yep, freestyle those joints truck. um cage style chassis there's if you can find them on ebay there are some old ecd chassis that Bari used to use that were kind of like the same style as uh extreme overkill was mm -hmm. basically just the cage you could try and find some of those and maybe make it work with an smt style axle mm -hmm. setup um uh, do you know of any more? I'm trying to think of not more. really. I don't. I'm sorry. Most of the ones like the Havoc that I mean, you want a cage setup, so I get it. But man, the, I run Havocs. The uh, ACRC Havocs are awesome aftermarket SMT 10 chassis, but um, I don't. Uh, yeah, I can't really think of any other off the top of my head. KK2 is what I was going to suggest. The uh, yeah, the, the KK2 South, is a Southland. very realistic looking chassis. Yeah. Uh, the ZEI, the ZRD from Freestyle RC, but again, I don't know if those axles are really going to work outside of anything other than maybe a racing setup. Yeah, I um, have to roll through here. Here, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. Uh, this is uh, Q the Winged Serpent. Hello, Mr. Serpent. You requested questions, so if you don't mind, here's mine. I'm building a retro with a CPE time warp chassis. The question is how do I current how I currently have it set up as a long wheelbase using stock arms and gearboxes are not flat when viewed from the side. Both tilt in to the center, giving caster to the front and rear, but in different directions, if that makes sense. And he's got locked rear steering. Is this an issue at all? And Josh, did he I see you responded actually? He's, you said send a message uh, to you yeah, on I Facebook. I kind of want to see some pictures of his. I kind of wanted to see some pictures of it uh, so I could get a better idea of exactly what he was talking about. I'm mentally there. having kind of a problem too in seeing this 
just what he described. I'm thinking what he described. If he's got that angle, no, it's not a huge deal, but I'd have to see how, how, how much we're talking here, I suppose. So how about send that message to Josh and we can answer this yeah. in another Q and A or Josh can just message you um, separate on that. We have a, uh, you want to answer the, uh, uh, Josh, read the jazz YOLO. Yeah. Jazz YOLO here on YouTube says he got a modded SMT 10 after years of watching us race and he uh, decided he wanted to buy, and then he immediately grenaded the transmission in 10 minutes after he got it out of the box. Uh, to go on in the question, though, he asks, what about a, uh, what about putting leaf springs on this style setup? I'm assuming he's talking about an, putting leaf springs on an SMT-10 and creating a leafer-style truck. Yeah, uh, I think um, that's what he's... Yeah, I haven't personally done that. I've seen it done um as far as mounting them how to do it or anything like that i'm not 100 percent sure exactly how to do it doug might have a little bit more of an idea than me. actually i'm sorry i read that wrong here i think he's actually saying he's uh he's using an scx 10 2 and he's going to try and mess with the four link and turn it into a a leaf spring you know i don't really know on this i know some i've wanted to do this i haven't seen i i think on rc rc crawler there is somebody who maybe sells shackle kits for the chassis to put leafs under them. I'm going to be real honest. I'm not really sure on this. I think John, actually, John Arnold, JB Scale Graphics, has messed around with this too. In a, yeah, some, John's working on one. I he? know Gavin Johnson's working on one as well. Actually, his may be done, but uh, he'd, he'd be a guy to maybe contact through Facebook. Gavin Johnson. Yeah, this truck up, looks really nice. It's a Bigfoot. Yeah, and John's looks cool too. Um, look up JB Scale Graphics on Facebook, or John might even comment below here, Jazz Yolo. Um, I'll message him actually later and tell him to get a hold of you. I wish I could help you more on that, but he is working on it. So if nothing else, hopefully we can help you get the info you need. Um, let's see here. We have, let's see here, but uh, Bill Cox, he just says, hey, that was a great discussion, guys. My first grade hobby, my first hobby grade RC was Claude back in 91. Something special about a clot. I agree. But the last one here, <laughs> let's end with this one, Josh. You know which exactly. one this is. And I got the picture. I'm going to pull it up here as soon as you get the question. All right. This is a great conversation. Any strange or off the wall custom clod buster setups from the past that are noteworthy or interesting. I'll let Doug pull up the picture of what I found. But uh, he does go on to say here about <laughs> a dual servo setup. Here we go. We got a coconut clod buster chassis. This is the most off the wall as you could possibly get. This is a, I, as, I remember seeing this whenever this was being built. Like I, it's, it's this so was the first thing that popped in my mind when I read this question. It was like, oh yeah, the guy that made it out of the coconut. Yeah, that's pretty off the wall. I hope you guys can uh, see this as I'm scrolling through, but it's literally a coconut. He he made a chassis out of a a coconut, a real coconut. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's it's pretty cool, but I don't know if how well or how durable it is, but. <laughs> But yeah. uh, he does go on to say here the dual servo setups so that was actually Defiance RC that did that back in the day for the NRC TPA, and most of the servos back in the day didn't quite have the torque or turning ability as far as um, getting those big tires to go around. So that's why they come out with that that dual servo setup. Nowadays you don't need that dual servo setup at all. There's so many servos out there with over 500 ounces of torque. Yes, it'll break you your them. arm servos. Some of them now, it's like you got no problem. Mm -hmm. You can get those big ones now. You'll want a BEC though. If you're gonna yes. if you're gonna be running one of these big ones, but Josh, we forgot to mention that that project was the uh, the coconut. That cloud was called the Nutbuster. <laughs> I forgot about that. Forgot I, about that. I yes. would be I doing it. Name. Oh, there was there was one I couldn't find. Uh, a guy had made a chassis completely out of wood, which it looked like a, a real monster truck, just completely out of wood. And uh, I thought. Man, I hope it wasn't balsa. That was my first initial thought when I saw that. That structural integrity of the wood is probably makes more sense than the uh, coconut. So I don't know. The coconut, it doesn't look like it's going to bottom out at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, all right. Well, hey, guys, that was all the questions we had. Thank you guys very much for this. Sorry, this, this week's a little bit shorter. We're going to be back with a, a, a regular episode next week with the topic. And again, um, we are going to do one soon on starting a club. And I will try and see if I can get some of the other guys that run the regional clubs around the country. And just to kind of hear, hey, how did it start with them? Because I think that that makes it easier. You know, we can tell you how Trigger King started, but that's just one. You know, there's big clubs, small clubs. Um, I know our friends like down in Memphis, Tennessee, 
they've been racing for years and I don't even, I think they, they don't even have that many people, but they always consistently race. So you don't have they to always have. consistently race and they always have a consistent turnout too. Yeah. When they go to race. Yeah. You don't I would have like, to I would have like to see some bigger clubs come in the discussion as well. I'd like to see uh, Dan DeFalco and Kyle DeFalco come on that one. I'd like to maybe, you know, them, right? from Michigan. yeah, I could shoot them. Just, message just message and have let's I'm, I'm it's open platform. If you're watching this and you run an RC monster truck club, I would love to have you on with Josh and I, uh, soon so we can have a nice round table discussion on on that i'm sure it'll be fun there might even be some heated things on there with some opinions so i think that'd be fun to see if we can get a bunch of people on it i agree i think it would be a blast to have a lot of those guys come on here there might be a little bit of a heated discussion here and there more but... and fun but still it's yeah, just again that's the I mean, fun it's, of... it's, toy, it's rc monster truck racing it's always supposed to be in fun exactly well um with that guys uh, we are done. You can read me on BigSquidRC.com every week. Monster Truck Madness column. Of course, I am here as well. I'm also on Big Squid Live on Thursday nights, most Thursday nights. Josh, what do you got going on? I know you always have your shows. Yep. Uh, this week, the Retro Monster Truck Review Podcast is going to be covering TNT Motorsports Richmond 1989 with fellow Trigger King racer Chris Parrish. Longest episode ever at almost two hours. We cover both shows and it was a really fun discussion. Both nights. I can't wait for that one to hit. Both nights, yes. So, well, I won't give away what happened. I actually watched both of those the other night because I knew you were doing them. And um, I had forgotten. Well, okay, we can talk. The Equalizer Wreck. I remember that. Yeah, the I don't a wreck and uh, there's a certain black and green truck that just seems to lose its way straight into the final round. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember that thing. at all. I don't remember the name of that truck though, but it might be behind me. Well, but anyway, uh, didn't, that's what's wasn't, coming up this week. What's that? That I, if I remember right, wasn't that one of the monster truck classics episodes that was, it was yes. That particular episode was on monster truck classics that monster jam put out. I remember buying those yeah. DVDs. I still and, have uh, those DVDs somewhere. Yeah, I, I've got them somewhere here. Whenever I can actually build a studio, I've got a bunch of cool monster truck memorabilia I'll put out. But check Josh uh, Josh's show out. I'll put that in the his show as always uh, in the link. He's on Spotify, Retro Monster Truck Review, uh, me and BigSquidRC.com. And really, that is it. I want to thank you guys very much for watching, and we will see you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.